The message that I would like to talk about today is found in 2 Corinthians, there's 2 Kings, 22nd and 23rd chapter. The scripture I'd like to start out with is about King Hosea, uh, the second, cha- uh, second verse of the 22nd chapter. It says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in all the ways of his father, and turned not the right hand or to the left. I, I don't know if I could ever get as high a credential as that from God. That's the kind of credentials we all want to have, I believe, as Christians, don't we? But uh, the topic I'd like to talk about this morning is the, a discovery of a great value. There are times when we have lost something or we're searching for something that's so great in our mind that it, it caused our mind just kind of locks in and we can't hardly get anything else done. There was a gem mine, or there is a gem mine in Franklin, North Carolina that offers a type of treasure hunt. Visitors pay for a bucket of dirt and rocks out of a mine and they get whatever they find out of it and they can throw the rest away. Most of the time the buckets are just full of dirt and rocks. But once in a while, someone will come away with something really valuable. In July 1995, a third grader bought a bucket of this stuff for six bucks. As he was rummaging through it, throwing stuff away, he found a little stone with a shape of he kind of liked. So he kept it, threw the rest away, and as he left the mine, A saleswoman from the souvenir shop noticed the rock and asked if she could look at it and gave it a closer look. That little boy had his hand on a 1,104 carat sapphire worth $45,000. He just paid for his college education, I think. And at least at that day, maybe it's not his hire today. But King Josiah decided he would embrace what he found in God's word. And his decision led a national revival among everybody. Now Josiah came in when he was eight years old to become king in a very wicked country. The previous kings had led the people down the wrong direction into paganism and sin and wickedness. So to be an eight-year-old boy leading a country and that shape is amazing. But he had a, a very strong, must have had a great mother who taught him the ways of God best she could. It is ways, always fun to discover something of great value. It, you know, if you've really been searching for an intense, when you get it, this kind of brings a peace. I can sit down and relax now. Even better, though, is being the person who benefits by such a find. We hear about these things, and we read about it in the news all the time, but the biblical account of King Josiah gives insight to how to be that person. When it comes to spirituality, there's quite a message here. In 2 Kings 22, verses 4 and 5, we read about the discovery... That was made when he was 18 years old of his reign. It came about when he sent the instructions for Hilkiah, Hilkiah the high priest, and gave him money and gave him manpower to go and and clean up the temple, the Lord's house. It was a mess. It was a disgrace. He'd gone in there and he was... It was depressing to see how God had been just shoved aside, trash on the floor, all sorts of stuff, walls, stuff coming off the walls. After repairs had begun, a report came back to the king that Hilkiah, the high priest, had, according to verse 8, 
found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Now, there's no greater story more exciting than the account of the finding of the law during Josiah's renovation of the temple. Now, you may kind of wonder, well, what's so great about finding a book? How many of you have more than one Bible in your home? Maybe you have more than you don't even know how, what, how many you have. But we have books. I had a library that I had to get rid of a lot of it when I left St. Louis. And, and then I got rid of a lot more when I got here. And I gave it to some other pastors that uh, primarily one, my son-in-law, uh, that I knew he could benefit from. And quite a library of them. I still have quite a few, by the way. But I, from time to time, I look back, hmm, I kind of wish I hadn't given that one away. Because I needed to find something in it. But I get the impression, and knowing the day and age, they didn't have printers. If you're going to write a book, it had to be pretty short because you had to hand write it. And I would have a problem with that. You wouldn't be able to read my writing very well. But uh, to find a book was something of great value because it probably was the only book in the nation. And they didn't have it. It hadn't been read for a long time. God's word is priceless. You could wonder why the book was so important. Most of us today have many Bibles, as I said. This find was about God revealing himself and to, the, to whom he gave it to during his kingdom, during his reign, Josiah. The law was not uncovered by accident. God could have disclosed this finding in previous kings, but he didn't. He chose Josiah. Knowing this, the question we might ask ourselves why Josiah? What did he do that caused the Lord to draw near to him in a special way? Well, we read that verse at the beginning, and I'll read it again in a few minutes, but we often pray individually and collectively for God to move among us and give us a spirit of revival. Essentially, we ask that we re he reveals himself to us and giving us fresh understanding of the work and person of Jesus Christ. He comes alive to us during special meetings. We got one coming up next next month. We renew our appreciation of the truth. What Josiah experienced with the discovery of God's law is an example of a revival. Seemingly it came solely at God's determination. However, Josiah exhibited a pattern of behavior throughout his reign which invited God's blessing. You remember his credentials, pretty high, and that came from God. I can't imagine if you got a, you know, kind of a certificate from God that gave that verse and had your name on it. You'd think you'd put that in a frame and prize it with your life but encourage you to live by it. In examining, examining his life, we get a glean of those behaviors were, and seek to develop them in our own lives. We encourage, I hope through this message this morning that we can understand we can all have those credentials. The Bible tells us he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 2. Josiah was 16 when he first sought the Lord. 20 when he sent out to purge the land of idols. 26 when he ordered the renovation of the temple. Though he was young and may have lacked spiritual knowledge because they didn't have any written material. He did what he knew was right. 
His workers did not find the book of law laying in the street somewhere. They found it in the Lord's house while they were cleaning. Now that's kind of a spiritual sign to us while we're cleaning up our lives, making sure everything is pure. We can find God's word there. They were positioned to find the book because Josiah had looked at the Lord's house and he was ashamed and at the disgrace the, the building was. Something needed to be done. The temple needed to be cleaned up and repaired. He honored the Lord both in his words and his deeds. If we are going to experience revival, it will not be because we stumble upon it somewhere. We are going to do what is right in the sight of the Lord in order to receive a revival in our hearts. We must honor God in our lives if we want to receive his blessings like Josiah. We may lack knowledge and understanding, but if our desire is to serve God and have all the light that we have, God will bless us. He may reprove or instruct us in a few areas, but if our desire is to do what is right, he will help us. Josiah, uh, Josiah's response to God uh, it was correction and another reason God chose to reveal his word to him was found in 2 Kings 22 verses 10 and 11 where it says, And Shapham, the scribe, showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes. He then commanded Hilkiah in verse 13, Go ye inquire the Lord for me and for the people, for all Ju Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord, that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of the book to do according unto all that which is written concerning it. Josiah responded with humility, with a heart of remorse. He didn't blame anybody else. He saw a need for action. When he realized that he and his people were not in compliance with God's word. He could have been non-responsive. You know, there's a lot of people who sit in church Sunday after Sunday and hear the word of God go forward, but they're not responsive. Instead, he was grieved, and he humbled himself before God, mourning the wrong with willingness to turn from it. What is the attitude toward God that we have? When God corrects us, do we try to make an excuse? I hope we're not like Adam and Eve. The blame game. That's easy to do. Not quite that bad. Yeah, no one's perfect, you know, but I'm not as bad as that one. You're not going to get the blessings of God if that's your attitude. Is it one of the inactivity or humility? Josiah, his response brought God's blessing. Amen. And the Lord told him in verse 19, because thine heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I speak against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. There's a way to get God's attention. An attitude of humility and quick to obey allows God's spirit to illuminate and change our life. That needs to incur in a person's heart before he really gets what God has for him. The attitude it results were exemplified in another person of his story that I have here. Uh, Frederick Charrington, who lived in 1850 to 1936. He was a member of a wealthy family in London and owned the Charrington Brewery. 
His personal fortune derived solely from the brewery enterprise exceeded millions. One night, a year after Charrington's conversion to Christianity, at age 19, he was walking along a London street with his friends when the door of the pub, or we'd call it a tavern here, suddenly flew open a few steps ahead of him, ahead of the group. A man staggered out onto the street with a woman clinging to him in desperation. The man, who was obviously very drunk, was swearing at the woman and trying to push her away. The woman was gaunt and in rags. She pleaded with him over and over again, please come home. Our children haven't eaten for two days and I haven't eaten for a week. If you aren't going to come home, could I have at least some of the money so I can buy a little food for the children? Before she could finish, the man brutally struck her and sent her to the ground like a rag doll, landing right in front of Charrington. Her husband stood over her, still swearing, and was just about to swing her, uh, swing at her again when Charrington rushed forward and grabbed the man. There was a scuffle all the way to the ground, but he was able to bind the man's hands behind him while the other, the rest of the group ran to hate, give aid to the woman. In a short time, the police came and took the man to jail and the woman to the hospital. But the important thing about this message was what happened after that. In that moment, God revealed himself to Charrington in a special way, shedding his light on the family's activities. And the multimillionaire brewer was faced with a choice in how to respond. As Charrington got up and brushed off his clothes, he noticed a sign on the window of the pub which says, Drink Charrington Ale. He later wrote of that experience when he said, When I saw that sign, I was stricken just as surely as Paul on the road to Damascus. The source of my family wealth was producing untold human misery before my own eyes. Then and there I pledged to God that not another penny of that money should come from me. After that incident, Charrington got rid of all the assets pertaining to the brewery business. Eventually he gained a reputation in London of working with the temperance movement to help those get away from drinking alcohol. Charrington was a man who, when confronted with his wrongdoing, turned away to pursue righteousness. It didn't take him long. Right then, he made a decision. But all oh, those some major things he had to change. Likely wasn't a millionaire before it was over with. This is what God is looking for, someone who will receive correction with remorse and then wholly embrace the truth. Like Charrington, Josiah not only turned away from what he was doing, but he turned toward God. Second Kings 23, from verses 2 and 3, we find that the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, and he read to their, in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book and all the people stood to the covenant. You know, the picture I get is when I was about four years old, I was at camp meeting, and there'd been some, that year was a very, very difficult year where a group of people, including some ministers that left our church, that was very important in Portland. And I remember Brother Ray got up before the congregation, and he gave a rather somber speech, as important for us to be in unity. And he asked 
how many here will stand with the gospel? I remember him saying that, and I was out in the front row, and I don't know if my feet could even touch the floor, but I couldn't get off that chair fast enough and stand up right on the front row. I was four years old. I didn't fully understand all the ramifications of it, but I wanted to be part of it. And it blessed me as I read this. This is what he did. It was just one reading of God's word, he changed the course of the nation. Like King Josiah, we too must be willing to change to do the Lord's work and do what he asks. If we will consecrate our lives in doing God's will and purpose to follow holiness, he will make us able to keep our commitment. God's power will be in us to do so. As a young man, when I would kneel or meditate in prayer, I would tell the Lord, I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. It just kind of rolled out. It was easy to say. And I thought I meant it. But one time after work, I'd only been married about a, a month. First time we'd had a, started with a nice, beautiful home, car, trailer. We had more, you know, even though we we're a little sparse on the furniture, it was a, more than we ever had in our life. And I remember walking up the stairs of the house, and I don't know what caused me to uh, even think of this at that time, and usually it was when I was in prayer, but getting saying again, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. Oh. Suddenly, I heard a voice in my mind, in my heart. Do you really mean what you say? And I froze right there, right on the porch. I just literally froze, came to a stop. Whoa, is he going to ask me to leave all this and go a different direction? I mean, I never had this before. It's exciting. New marriage couple. God was blessing. But after I thought it through, I again said it, but in a real meaningful way. I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I don't know what prompted that prayer, but God helped me to make a consecration, solidify my commitment to him, and I continued to pray that same prayer after that, but real fervent. I kept everything with a loose hand from that point on. It was 20 years later, a phone call from the overseer of our organization, Brother Dwight Valsell, asked me if I'd be willing to move and become a pastor. Well, as I said, we had a beautiful home. We had people come over all the time, get in our hot tub and big backyard. We have a lot of young people back there. And I thought I was doing a good ministry. Two cars. We were, we were well supplied. We had a great job. But you know, when he, he called, I said I talked to my wife about it, but I already settled it. As soon as I mentioned to my wife, we settled it right then. Moment, we didn't have to talk about it. We had already made that commitment. We'll go where you want me to go. My consecration was still on the altar. And my wife and I had made a commitment from years earlier. Had no idea. But we held it with a loose hand. And when it came, we sold our home, quit the business, and moved to Eureka. This is a discovery treasure that anyone can have to make that commitment. Anyone. There is something much greater value than can be found in a bucket of dirt in North Carolina mine. It is having God's presence in our lives, intimacy of our Lord. The best news is that anyone can find it. You know, not too many found much in those buckets of dirt and rocks, but anyone can find God Amen. and his blessing Amen. and the great treasure he has for us. Are you willing to honor God in your life? Respond to his correction. 
with humility and turn in that direction. It may not be easy. It may change the whole pattern. I had a lot of dreams like anybody else. But those went outside when God called. Amen. He calls all of us. So if he asked, it can be yours. If God's talking to your heart, or your heart today and calling you to commit it all, you may not know what it is. You consecrate it, and those consecrations change from day to day, but keep it under the altar, whatever it may be. I had no idea 20 years before what that would amount to. But God knew. He knew when. He knows about us too. So let's stand and sing 88 and come down and ask God to help us walk according to his word. We've got the word of God, the greatest thing in the world. If we have knowledge in here, we have more knowledge than doctors of divinity, doctors of all sorts of things in the world. We have it all right here. Let's stand and read it and follow it. God bless you.